So the question is, what do distributed systems, dictators and Indian drivers have in common? And I'll give you the answer right away. It involves coordination amongst different things. If you look at distributed systems, you take, I mean, a, a distributed system can be where computing resources are at some distance from each other. So at a very micro level, you have different processors that are, that take, I mean, light takes a finite amount of time. And when you're running a processor at 3 gigahertz, a light can only travel what? A foot, one foot distance in one nanosecond. So it's like a one third of a foot it can travel, right? So the distance between two processors makes a difference. It's actually a distributed system. Timing makes a difference, right? Whether it is two multiple processors within, on a board, multiple boards in, in a rack, multiple racks in a data center, multiple computers in a data center or multiple data centers. This is like a fractally self-similar kind of a setup, right? It's a distributed system. So that's one. You have traffic where you are, if you have to get through, you have to coordinate with others. And there are signals that you emit, that you send, whether it is by showing road rage or by frown or whether you show a traffic signal, or you're communicating. So there's a whole bunch of coordination that is happening in order to get a joint task achieved, whether it's to drive in the same fashion or to get anything done, like, you know, what a, what a data center can do. And about dictators, it's like, you know, if you are, uh, you know, if you are part of a revolutionary mob, you don't want to be the one opposing, I mean, unless you really have the guts, those are the people who really do anything. But if you have to have a mob, there is a way of coordinating it so that you can depose a dictator. And there are rules of engagement. There are ways in which a revolution becomes successful. There are ways in which it doesn't. And many of the same patterns are, are come across in many of these places. So today's, uh, so all of this is the study of communication and coordination amongst various nodes. There is a formal way of dealing with this. Uh, there are particular kinds of logic that are used to deal with study of coordination and you know how various nodes acquire information, how they disseminate information and coordinate to get something together. And one of the ways in which you can reason about the correctness uh, of such protocols is through something called knowledge logic. It's formally called epistemic lo logic. Episteme is just the Greek word for knowledge. So it can be called knowledge logic and in, there is a subset of it called belief logic. I'll talk more about this in, in, a, um, in a few moments. But the idea is that what, what makes like a, uh, let's talk about a communication protocol, right? Suppose I say, I want to go to dinner with my friend and I say, where do you want to, what do you want to eat? And he says, I don't know. Okay, do you like Chinese? Ah, no, I don't like Chinese. Now, that kind of protocol interaction does not foster action. You are still back to not eating anything. You have not come back, come to a decision. A more effective protocol would be to say, here are the five choices. You get to decide amongst these. Let's whittle it down. And they bring a subset. You whittle it down. And as, because the, sub, the subset is shrinking, at one point, you have consensus that is desirable to both. And so you have a coordinated action, the action being to go out to eat. You, have, you come to a decision. So you can design protocols in such a way where you have concerted action, you have coordinated action. Otherwise, you'll just be spinning around making no progress at all, right? So whether you want to navigate traffic, whether you want to have computers get together and do something meaningful together, or whether we want to navigate tra traffic, depending on the grammar of the traffic. You know, the way you drive here is not the same as the way you drive in the US or Europe, but each has its own grammar. And a good driver will figure out the grammar or the rules of the, of the game, right? So knowledge logic. The word knowledge is very hugely overloaded. It's like, you know, the term energy. The Kundalini people say energy and the physics people say energy, they mean completely different things. 
and there are the scamsters in between who will who will easily like you know go through one between they say yeah yeah thermodynamics yeah that's why your kundalini is good it has nothing to do with each other right so the word knowledge is also used the vedic people will say vedic knowledge and then there are pe other people who have very different notion of the knowledge so in knowledge logic there is a specific very mathematically rigorous definition of what they call knowledge now it may not necessarily it it appeals to some part of your intuition but in order for it to be rigorous things have to be it, it does not it does not map completely to human behavior because that's much more complex but it's very good for precise systems for precise semantics for computing systems ourselves we are talking about knowledge right so we technically call ourselves homo sapiens but homo sapiens actually covers all primates all intelligent primates whether it is chimpanzees orangutans so of course we can't be just in the same group as orangutans and chimpanzees so we have given ourselves we are actually technically homo sapiens sapiens so homo sapiens means sapient the word comes from sapere which means to know so sapient means to be wise so we, the primates are the wise the ones who know homo sapiens sapiens that is just humans we know that we know there is a level of indirection level of reflection we know that we know right and that's the kind of thing that knowledge logic revels in so i don't know how many of you have seen this friends uh, how many of you not, don't know anything at all about friends okay there are handful of people okay you don't have to know but i'll tell you as we go along so there's one episode where there's this remarkable this phrase that says they don't know that we know they know we know and in the episode it sort of works up to this the stage so i'll come to this uh, this thing but let me first introduce a little notation so in traditional boolean logic we have you know uh, propositions in a particular world where propositions have given given truth value that is true or false csk1 ipl 2003 yeah definitely that's a true statement p1 or p2 oh, by the way uh, some people say phi some people say phi phi is the mathematical way of saying it or the greek way of saying is phi okay so if you're used to saying phi then i used to say phi too but it took me a while to <laughs> rewire my head so you have a bunch of these propositions you have a bunch of correctives and you can string together arbitrarily long formulae whose truth value you can compute right so you can create a truth table out of it now that's basic boolean logic now with boolean logic it does not take the context into account by context i mean let me explain by a few examples there is an extension of boolean logic a family of logics which have their own rules called modal logic by mode it means that depending on the context it basically you can call it contextual logics depending on the context the truth value of something might change so for example if the context were time that would be a temporal logic where you say today this was true tomorrow this is not true but this is true forever because it's nailed in time if you just said cs csk1 ipl next year it may not be true right it's temporally dependent so then you have operators in that logic which which where you can say for all time this is true and that's a formula as well or there exists a time when this will be true there exists a time t when this will be true and the truth of that will be will that be true at all at some point and you have to be able to reason through it right so for example if you have a signal that goes up and stays up then you have to be able to formally prove that it will consistently stay up while other things are changing and so you will say for all time this is remains true and you have to be able to prove that formula based on other other things that are changing in time these are a family of logics that are dependent on context the context that we care about is the worlds of possibilities and i'll give you an example so here is a world of possibility that's one context here is a world of possibility that's another context and each of these contexts we have agents talking to each other and we care about what the agents know about a certain fact okay so informally i will use the word knows so it adds a one extra operator called k kx p1 means x knows p1 right so x agent x knows whether it's sunny outside okay knows the truth 
knows that it is true. So if I say kx p1, if this is true, if this is true, that means that x knows that it's sunny outside and it is sunny outside. It you can't believe a you, you in in this logic. One of the fundamental axioms is that if something is false, you can't say I know it. Right? That would be belief logic. That's the difference between knowledge logic and belief logic, where you can you can say I know something even if that, that something happens to be false. That is not allowed here. Here, if I say I know something, that something must be true. That's a fundamental given of this logic, right? It's an axiom. So now you have you can have similar to Boolean logic, you have connectives. So for example, you can say doesn't know P1, not Kx would be doesn't know versus knows not P1. Right? The difference between the two is when I say no, you have to in mentally think of it as no for certain. So the, the second one says I know for certain, x knows for certain that phi is not true. Whereas the first one says it doesn't know the truth value of phi 1. Okay, that is the semantics of no. So for example, here in this case, the truth value of this expression will be like is this true in all contexts? We say x knows phi 1 or x doesn't know phi 1. Now, in some contexts, it may be false because it's not like he definitely knows it to be true or definitely knows it to be false. He may not know at all. That's a third possibility. So, this by itself may have a false value in some context, in, in one world. Right? So, you can't make definitive statements. This is a definitive statement. That's what knowledge logic is about. So, basically, we are not talking about probabilities here. We are talking about utter uncertainty or not certain at all. Right? It's a, it's a, still a binary. It's still an extension to Boolean logic. There are probabilistic interpretations also, but we are not going there. And of course, like in this case, you'll say x knows phi1 and it's not the case that y knows, y doesn't know about the result of phi1 or phi2. Don't know whether either or two. Okay? So that's the notation. So given that notation, let's examine the friends context. So, for those of you who have not seen this, uh, this serial, there are six friends. For the purpose of this, there are two groups. There are two of them who have secretly hooked up with each other and there are four of them. These guys, the truth of this statement is Chandler and Monica are an item. Right? That is true. They have hooked together. They know that it's true. They know they have hooked up together. Right? So, KCM by CM, I am representing this block, this agent or this node, let's say. They know that it is true. These guys don't know, the rest of them don't know that this is true. Okay? So, no. Then something happens, Joey goes on back and forth between the two apartments, word leaks, even though he's not actually saying it out, but in his innocence, he betrays some bit of information where the situation changes. And these guys know what? They're an item. But at the same time, these guys don't know that these guys know. <laughs> right? There is until the signal travels and they understand, if the signal doesn't go, there is an imbalance of knowledge. Right? These guys know, Chandra and Monica don't know that the rest of them know. Okay? But then Joey goes elsewhere. So they change, they'll say, what? They know. These guys don't know that they know. <laughs> Right? So, of course, they figure it out because they force Joey to cough up the whole tale. So, they know. But meanwhile, these guys are uncertain. They, they don't know for a fact that these guys have come to know. So, this is, this is Phoebe's famous line which says, they don't know that we know that they know that we know that they are an item. Right? This is just an example of how the compound things strings together. As more and more communication happens, there is a level of knowledge that is added and there are different levels of composition and they are not equal to each other. Okay? And it is this inequality that breeds uncertainty and can get in the way of coordination. Okay? So, this is just an example of the way syntax is used. <coughs> so, 
the real question is what does i know really mean and is there a difference and what is the kind of a difference between different levels of stacking up these k operators right what does it mean in practice and why bother right so to figure out the i know part and this worlds of possibilities idea let's look at a simple example so there is a very famous puzzle called the muddy children puzzle in the 1950s it used to be called the cheating husband puzzle but now things have times have become more polite so you call it the muddy children puzzle and the puzzle goes like this there are five children it doesn't matter any number of children but five children three of whom after playing they have mud on their heads but they don't know that none of them know whether or not they have mud on their foreheads three of them actually happen to know but if you see from outside three of them happen to know that they have mud on uh, so, uh, three of them have mud on their foreheads just they don't know it the ones who don't have it they also don't know whether they have mud on their foreheads or not so the teacher says say yes or raise your hand if you know you have mud on your forehead now i just told you they don't know so they can't say yes right clearly so the teacher now says okay i'll give you a clue at least one of them one of you has a muddy forehead at least one of you has a muddy forehead now he has said something that is patently obvious to everyone each of the kids can see at least two kids or three kids because there are three of them each of them can see a kid with a muddy forehead if somebody had asked them does at least one of you have a muddy forehead they'll say yeah every one of them will say right the teacher has he says it's a clue but what has really contributed to the whole thing so then he asks okay say yes if you have mud on your forehead and nobody says anything so he says say yes if you have mud on your forehead after three times all three kids who have mud on their foreheads they raise their hand and say yes so the question is what value did the teacher add by saying something obvious and what information was conveyed in this whole process something changed where all three coordinated to say yes and it was exactly three if there are three kids with uh, mud on their foreheads it will take three rounds now we will not spend time I mean, if it was my class i would have made you all figure it out and it's not easy it's not simple to, um, it's not difficult to figure it out it's a simple inductive argument but i will walk through a simpler example myself okay so let's say it's a simple solution the simple arrangement you have three kids two are mischievous and they have mud on their foreheads one of them doesn't of course neither of them none of them knows whether they have mud on their foreheads or not okay so at round 0 like before any, before the teacher has even said anything this is the way a is thinking a says i am there are two possibilities there are two possible worlds i could be in either i have mud on my forehead or i don't have mud on my forehead the other two he can see the other two he can see and he says there are two possibilities either i am in this world or in this world if i am in this world now the here the nose and nose thing i imagine what b must be thinking if i am in this world and because he can't think he doesn't know he must be uncertain because he doesn't know what he is in he must imagine two possibilities where he has mud on his forehead and he doesn't have mud on his forehead in this world we don't know none of them know which world they are in in this world a thinks he is in b's head a thinks b must think like this b cannot know for certain okay in this world a doesn't have mud on his forehead but b he knows like he he was uncertain b is also uncertain symmetrically he has mud on his forehead or he doesn't have mud on his forehead this is what he imagines b must be imagining right so he remains quiet because there are all these possibilities i mean for a there are all these possibilities none of which can be cancelled out right so he is uncertain so he doesn't ra raise his hand b in the symmetrical fashion also does not raise his hand so now the teacher says i'll give you a clue at least one of you has mud on your face so a says aha this is not a possibility then if i were in this world and b was uncertain then b would cancel this out and if that was the case 
if he remains quiet in this round, that means he can see me. He must immediately deduce that he has mud on his face. Because he knows that I don't, in this world, I don't have mud on my face. So B would, at the end of round one, he must say, aha, I'm in this world. And so, there must be, uh, you know, uh, 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 and I have mud on my face, so he should raise his hand. But he did raise his hand, which means he is not in this world. So at the beginning of round two, it's clear that we are in this situation. Neither of these are active. We are in this situation where we are in this situation where in both cases A has mud on his forehead. So A raises his hand. By a symmetrical argument, B raises his hand. Okay. The way if you want to build up an inductive argument is a if there are only one kid, initially he doesn't know anything whether he has mud on his forehead or not. If the teacher says at least one of you has mud on your forehead, then he'll say, yeah, I just him. If there are two people, then you can you can argue symmetrically, you can argue similarly. Right? And then you can build up an inductive argument that goes up to there are n kids, it'll take n rounds. Each child imagines a recursive world of possibilities. If this is my state, then from this state, because you can see me, my peers' states must be this. Based on the information I have sent him, which is basically you can see me, these are the worlds that he can build for himself. Right? It's a nested world, and in the more general case, it's a graph of possibilities. The communication of any communication that happens, it updates local state, as in each is thinking for himself. Right? They are not fiddling with somebody else's memory. They are only updating their own state and taking action based on their own inference. And every time you communicate, it increases the level of certainty. So you are essentially adding one more level of knowledge and at some point you are saying, yes, okay. So it is, we don't, uh, after round one, you know that you don't, you don't just have one, you, you have extra knowledge. And the reason you have extra knowledge is each kid hears other kids silence or uh, yes. So silence is as much an effective communicator as, as something verbal, right? In a synchronous system, staying silent has meaning. It's not like the signal is lost. When you have a, when you have a synchronous system that's based on a clock, then even silence can be used to communicate information. When you say A knows phi, that means agent A knows phi, that's what we said. The meaning of knows means there's no uncertainty. I know for sure, A knows for sure that phi is true. And in all the worlds that A can possibly find itself in, like he's imagining, in all the worlds that it can find, and recursively going through, overthinking it, right? All the possible consequences of it. If you find that this phi holds, then you know for certain that the A knows for certain that he knows this fact. If there is a world in which he can imagine that this fact is not true, then he cannot be certain because he doesn't know which, which state he is in. Right? Because there are certain things that can only be inferred based on outside observers. So, for example, if you say that there is no sun anymore, you would not know because it will still take 8 minutes for the light to, to stop before we know. We are in, this, in a state of you know, ignorance about the fact that the sun has just switched off. So, based on this, if you, if you enhance this knowledge thing, you say someone knows, which is A knows or B knows or C knows or if there are N agents until N knows, right? Similarly, conjunction, if you say A knows and B knows and N knows, that means everyone knows. Important thing here is when you say everyone knows, everyone knows privately. Doesn't, if just because A knows, doesn't mean that B knows that A knows. Right? They know privately that fact. A knows that everyone knows. That's an additional level of knowledge. Because A knows that everyone knows privately. Maybe they are just too afraid to say anything. Everyone knows that everyone knows. And in fact, you can keep stacking up E's. It's called E squared. You can say if you have N times E stack up E's, you have E to the N. And if you go all the way to infinity, that is called common knowledge. Everyone knows that, everyone knows that, regardless. I, mean, I know that, you know that, I know that, he knows. You can go infinitely often. There is not a shred of doubt, regardless of which way you go. That is called common knowledge. Now, in common 
in normal parlance, common knowledge is like yeah, everybody knows it's common knowledge. See, this is where the overloading of term comes. In this logic, common knowledge has a very, very specific semantics. Right? It's everyone knows to the infinite level about each other. They can play an infinite amount of scenarios and there is no, um, you cannot falsify. So what the father adds is common knowledge. The fact that at least one child has mud on the forehead, the moment he says it, everyone's heard it, it instantly becomes common knowledge. You cannot deny that I didn't and I don't know. I cannot, I, you know, I know that you know, you know that I know, I know that you know that I know. You can go it infinitely off. Right? By broadcasting this thing, you have basically added common knowledge. Similarly, when the when the kid does not say anything or say something, they have broadcasted their position. They have communicated something. If you see at round zero, even though B knows that there is at least one child has mud on the, one, on the forehead, A doesn't know that B knows. Everyone knows just not just B, but B knows that there is at least one child with mud on their forehead, right? This is trivially true. But A does not know because he can imagine a world when B does not know. So this does not hold. It should be not K A G B fee. Doesn't know. So this is something, it's, it's knowledge logic is used to reason about different uh, possible worlds. In, uh, in a lot of uh, psychology, there is this notion of a theory of mind. And it's fascinating to watch very young kids evolve where for example if you say there's a brother and sister and uh, you say i'm going to i'm keeping the chocolates here and uh, the sister goes out and this very young brother is uh, before the sister comes back the mother basically puts the chocolates elsewhere the brother sees it and now if you ask the brother and if he's very little he'll say where when she comes back where will she look for the chocolates right he will say here in the new place because he does not imagine himself in the sister's head until a certain age you are you don't imagine yourself in the sister's head and say no the last time the sister saw it was it was in this place and that's where she'll go looking when when the kid becomes a little older that's when they have the theory of mind which allows you to put yourself in the other's position and say the last time if i was the sister i would go looking there not here right and it's fascinating to watch the transition in a young kid, right? From two years to four years. So some applications of this common knowledge, what common knowledge can do. So when you say knowledge, it's a basis for action. Whatever state you have, you are a, you can act based on whatever knowledge you have. And you have a local knowledge, a local state. That's what, you know, whatever you, you know about your cultural context or history or whatever. In a processor, it is, it's a memory, right? Uh, and only based on that, it can issue any further commands. It can do any uh, any communication at all. You have communication protocols that help each up agent update its own state and updates their peers' state. And in generally, when you're a communication network designer, you are designing protocols that makes sure that the way they talk to each other, the kind of messages, the kind of information they send to each other, in spite of various failures of network of nodes and stuff like that, it eventually gets them to a coordinated action, right? That is the goal. And when you have common knowledge, it yields coordinated simultaneous action. When you have common knowledge, just like in the muddy children example, at the end of um, round three, when you have the three muddy kids, at the end of round three, all three raise their hands. Coordinated uh, simultaneous execution. They didn't like look at each other and say, you know, should be or should be not. They all were convinced based on their own local knowledge, based on what they had been updated by from their previous rounds. So lack of common knowledge is a problem. So here's an example from Indian traffic. You know how it is when you're driving and somebody just sails right through from a perpendicular road, like shamelessly just comes in from a side road, right? It's a characteristic of Indian traffic. And so if this guy doesn't He's unsure, right? If you have not made eye contact with this guy, you don't know what his intentions are. If you are a careful driver, you will slow down. And typically that's what happens. And this guy 
He may or may not have seen, he may, not, may, may or may not have the best of intentions. We don't know. As far as this guy is concerned, he doesn't know any of the stuff. But he's going to play it safe, he's going to slow down. But if you're a if you're a seasoned driver, you'll say this is what other people do when I just shamelessly go into traffic. So what I'll do is from now on, I will not make eye contact, I'll just drive through traffic and I know everybody will stop. Because we have not made eye contact, I know for a fact that others will be careful. But it takes two to tango, right? If this guy was also, also equally shameless, then we have a problem. Right? The protocol is not fail proof. You don't have common knowledge. You think, you have belief, you don't have knowledge. You think that that other guy doesn't is not going to do something. You are certain about something that is not that about his behavior, right? It is not true. You don't know what this guy is. Guy might be saying, how dare he go past like that? Like I, I have the road, I am going to go. So, a lot of examples in, in, in Indian traffic conditions are because of lack of common knowledge and you don't have a coordinated action. I see this a lot and this eye contact business is a big deal when it comes to communications and even in local interaction. If you are avoiding eye contact, you have something to hide. If you have you've made eye contact, then something happens where instantly there is common knowledge about, okay, we are on the same page, right? Often it happens in meetings in, in various situations. So, the, one of the situations is like this. So, you are a dating situation and you are wondering, is it a date or are you just hanging out for coffee, right? Yeah. So, then you are, you have this whole tussle going on in your head saying, uh, I know that she thinks I'm cute, but I don't know if I'm like date worthy, you're like, you know, you're thinking all this thing that based on other people's, you're putting, you're thinking what they're thinking about me. And meanwhile, the other person is also doing the same thing, right? You're not arriving at a common solution, which way, whichever way it is. All you have to do, one of them has to have the guts at least to say, say it out aloud. Whatever they want to say, I like you, something. Then you have instant common knowledge about, okay, this is where we stand. This is a new state of being. So, lack of common knowledge keeps people, you know, lots of movies have been made on that thing because they just didn't say it until the interval. Here's another example that happens in, in real life where you cannot have common knowledge because common knowledge sort of requires broadcasting. Everyone to hear it at the same time. So that's not always practical. So, you try to do something close. Here's an example from a uh, from a bank thing where you say you want to transfer some chunk of money from one account to another, from a bank and from an account in one bank to an account in another bank, right? Ideally, if you wanted to do the transfer, it would be common knowledge saying, okay, we are both understood that we are definitely doing the transfer and we are able to do the transfer. I should later come back and say, oh no, I ran out of this space, I'm sorry, I could do it. Because one of them is going to be really pissed because if you, if you, are very happy. Like if you if you withdrew the money and while crediting it, that guy said, sorry, I ran out of disk and I can't do anything about it. The account from which you have you have withdrawn the money, that's a problem. That guy is going to scream. Or if you have if you have credited the money without debiting it from somebody else, somebody is going to pay for it. Some bank manager, poor bank manager is going to pay for it. So, the what is the ATM? Let's just say the ATM is the one that is driving. It's not, but let's say the ATM is the one that's saying, okay, withdraw from here, deposit it here. You can give it to a third party coordinator, but the coordinator also has the same, same problem. Saying, if he says debit from here, credit to here, and anything can fail at any moment, you have a problem, right? The, the characteristic that you want in a transaction, in a database transaction is, either the transfer happens, or nothing happens. No, no amount balances are, are if, if one of them has a failure, no balances are touched. Nobody is unhappy. Or it happens. It's an atomic thing. No, many things happen in this, in this, in, in the process of doing this. But at the end of this result, it should be an atomic thing. In unbreakable, a transaction is unbreakable. It's atomic, right? It says that. Either it happened or it doesn't happen. So, how do we achieve that? We have a transaction coordinator. It's somewhat like a Christian wedding, where you have the padre who says, do you take this person to be your lawfully wedded wife? Yes, I do, right? Do you take this person to be a lawfully wedded husband? I do. I now pronounce you back husband and wife, right? So, that's a two phase, two rounds. In one round, you ask the questions, are you prepared to be married? Yes, you get a vote and if somebody says, no, I'm having doubts now, the whole deal is off, 
right so at the end of this result you are either going to be married or you are going to be remain unmarried there is no halfway doubtful thing or shit or what now what right no such thing right so that's the characteristic you are going for but there is a big difference between the way we are doing this and a marriage situation we will come to that so the first phase which is called a prepare phase the coordinator to says to the bank one make a note of this debit right eventually when i come back and tell you in the second phase only then do it but until then may prepare yourself don't let it come complaining about to me about lack of disk space and stuff like that right no errors once i say that the account is going to be debited what that bank is going to do is lock that account so that nobody can change that account that account any more meanwhile while this whole thing is happening right because it should not be that somebody meanwhile gives in and like change the change the amount and now suddenly the guy has a negative balance no 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 once you've said that you have taken this amount of money you have put a lock on that account and meanwhile the coordinator says to bank to are you prepared and that bank says okay i am prepared i have written it out to disk in the worst case if i crash i can come back and recover my state not a problem and nobody else can meanwhile come and touch this amount okay and then both of them say okay we are prepared and then the coordinator says okay the coordinator also writes it down on disk saying the, both of these guys it's it be duly noted that these two have said yes and then it goes back and says commit and that's when they formally change the account balances in both places that's a classic what is called a distributed transaction now i say that this is very process is very very similar but it's not identical because we don't have common knowledge why is that because if you look at the children's example when the children say yes they are broadcasting it so everybody knows what the other one said whereas here it is the equivalent of privately whispering to the teacher saying yes right here the answer goes back to the coordinator but the other one doesn't hear they are private communications one on one communication with the coordinator the banks are not talking to each other it's private one on one communication they are not broadcasting out to the general world that becomes very expensive which is why you can't use broadcast right for millions of transactions that are happening literally every minute in the world you can't do that so because of that there is a level of uncertainty you don't know the bank each bank does not know what other bank said so if the bank were to crash the coordinator is okay because he can ask the coordinator what happened should i go ahead or not the coordinator will say wait i need to you know until the guy comes back we can't do anything about it but if the coordinator and another bank crashes what is the guy going to do the remaining bank he holds on to the lock until until the others and the coordinator can come back come back up and god help you if the whatever the guy wrote the what of the coordinator wrote down on disk survive so if the coordinator does not remember what he wrote on disk or whether it even made it that far we don't have a decision so if they can't contact the coordinator at all he doesn't know the result of the decision so he cannot unilaterally take a decision to abort or to to go forward or to roll back he can't do that so the lock is held that account is inoperable by any other means lack of common knowledge does strange things now there are ways around it which we'll come back to later on but the point is that you don't necessarily don't have simultaneous knowledge but you you can have eventual coordination in time if you have a period of time where everything is stable you can achieve that right it's not the same thing as simultaneity but there are points where you need simultaneous common knowledge and you need simultaneous action so avionics is classic because you're going at such high speeds you know you have the flaps and you have the rudder and the airplane speed and everything else that need to be coordinated all at the same time so what you have in not just avionics systems but in modern all modern cars you have a very very tightly run synchronous network with multiple levels of fail safety if something doesn't answer in time you know exactly how much time it will take in the worst case because they are all real time systems and so you can reason about the amount of time it will take for a certain something to settle and if you have not heard back from something you can definitely say yes or no one way or the other there is no uncertainty there okay it's not like suddenly this thing will come up and say oh shit where was i and start blabbering some component will goes down these are called fail safe modules and they are called fail stop modules where if they have de deemed to have been failed 
they are kept down, they are powered off. Right? There are external monitors that will basically say if something has gone down for a while, it's not going to just jump up and say, oh, where was I? Okay, I, you know, it starts answering some old questions that it remembers. Uh, that kind of a thing happens often in uh, in in many software systems. So, like in a lot of Java based systems, you have a garbage collector, right? Garbage collection takes time. And you send, and if you have a massive amount of heap, it's possible that there are times when the CPU is just churning away collecting garbage because the whole memory is just filled with garbage stuff that needs to be collected. So, at that time, the all the processing just stops. So, it just freezes and then it's basically responding to some old stuff that's built in the queue. Meanwhile, somebody else has timed out and said, oh, okay, I'm going this direction because this guy is not answering. But he is incorrectly assumed that this fellow is dead, but he's not dead. He's just stalled, right? You have to, when you're building fault tolerant systems, there are all kinds of things that can go wrong. And often we call this as building on quicksand. The foundation is all quicksand. But you have to build a robust system on this quicksand. So when you work, when you do, you know, when you have any distributed system at all, and at the at the level of uh, the likes of Google or uh, you know Amazon or Microsoft, they have large data centers, hundreds of thousands of computers, and at some level, because of the probabilities, however low a probability is for a given component to go down, in the larger scheme of things, there's something other just popping every everywhere. So they are just basically driving around, changing disks, changing processors because something other. Because the scale is such huge. And so you are, you know, unlike your typical operating system that's built on, that assumes that your processor and disk are just going to be up. And if it's not up, then you are toast. Basically, you can't do anything about it. In a, in a system like Google's, what you have is that you assume that anything can fail. So it's like cells in, a, a, in an organ. Individual cells are dispensable, but the organ functions. Something else takes up the slack. So you're building a fault tolerant system based on the fact that everything is uncertain and you have ways of making things certain just by replicating things. So when you write, when you write an email, it actually gets replicated three ways. So two of the copies have to fail before, you know, you have a problem because the majority decision. So avionics is simultaneous coordination. CPU interaction with other CPUs, you know, DMAs, RAM, all this is because it's on a clock, you have simultaneous, it enables simultaneous coordination. In a surgical theater, operating theater, you have the, the, the chief surgeon calling the shots, right? You shouldn't be anesthetizing at the long, wrong moment. And they say, okay, give me a scalpel, you get a scalpel right at the, you know, the right things happen at the right time. It's all coordinated, similar to an orchestra, uh, where the conductor is actually keeping, keeping time because for many of them, the, if it's a large symphony, they cannot see the other, they cannot hear the other people necessarily. And so the only thing that they can do is see the conductor. And because light travels so fast, everybody is on the same. So deposing a dictator bit, let's talk about it shortly. But how do you get common knowledge? Uh, by saying something aloud or by broadcasting. That's a very classic way of doing things. At a personal level, you have eye contact, you have handshakes, where you are the same person, which is why it's much easier to get get a common knowledge if you're in the same room rather than on a phone call because it's much easier to read a person's attitude when you uh, when you make a deal or wherever you're using clocks in all computers i don't know if you know that if you have gps satellites each gps satellite essentially works because it has four atomic clocks each of them and all these atomic clocks are tuned to within three nanoseconds of each other so you, although it's not it's near simultaneous Right? So all of them are typically or basically on the same page for all practical purposes when it comes to agreement on time. And based on that, that is the coordination that they do. And based on that coordination, we can, we can make definite inferences on where we are because we can say this is the amount of signal time it takes for the signal to come here. This is the amount of time it takes for the signal to come here. This is the amount of time it takes for the signal to come here. I can make a 3D map. I know exactly where I am. Right? Because I know exactly where the where the satellite is, I can make some relativ relativistic corrections for both in special theory and uh, general theory of relativity, account for amount of time it takes, you know, uh, how much time, how much time will slow down because the satellite is traveling really fast and account for Earth's gravity. So it account, account for changes in that. I know precisely how much time it has taken 
for a particular signal to reach. All this because there is a coordinated set of atomic clocks that are basically circling around you. In a typical data center, you have something called a consensus services or shared coordination services. So when a data center comes up, there's a bunch of software that's the first thing to come up. At Google, there's something called Chubby. That's, that's a service. It's a bunch of computers that come up. They are the source of truth. Like if you're in doubt, you go ask Chubby, right? What is the configuration you ask Chubby? If you say, I want a lock on this particular piece of information, you tell Chubby, I want a lock. And if somebody else comes and says, I want a lock, then you put in a queue. Chubby gets to decide who may, has a lock. Okay. So because of that, because it's a shared service, you can get common knowledge. The, basically, it removes uncertainty. Yahoo has a similar setup. There is a, something called Zookeeper. That is a consensus software. And these, when I say slash Paxos, slash Zab, these are all the names of the protocol. So for those of you who are computer science students, you should definitely look up Paxos or Zab or Raft. In fact, Raft is the most common thing, most popular thing now. So if you are computer science students and you want to work with the likes of uh, Google or one of these big names, then make sure you know something about consensus. That's like, that's hot stuff. So back to deposing dictators. Dictators really hate common knowledge. So you can say King jong un is a thug. It's true, he's a thug, right? Everyone knows he's a thug. He wants everyone to know he's a thug so that you can be fearful of him. But he hates common knowledge because everyone privately knows he's a thug, but I'm not going to open my face in a party and say, you know, that guy's a thug because for all I know he's an informer. I don't know. I know that he's, that he's a thug. I can guess that you know, but I'm not going to open my mouth in a, in a repressive regime like that, right? So I don't know that everyone knows he's a thug. He wants everyone not to know he's a thug because that's how you so fear. And you cut out all means of communication between people so that you can keep them in, in darkness. So all public sharing mechanisms, this is classic for all dictators, whether you take Iran, whether you take the Arab revolution in Tahrir Square, whether you take, uh, you know, Turkey, Erdogan's, the way he's done it, North Korea, of course, China, and we are getting there, right? Lack of free press, no free press, no TV, radio broadcast critical of him, right? So basically, because if you have a TV broadcast that is critical, then immediately it becomes common knowledge that there are all these people who agree. And suddenly that becomes a basis for a revolution. If you cut out that thing at the source, how are you going to disseminate that information? It's going to be it's secretive, but it's not effective. You have what is called a great wall in China, which is basically a firewall that essentially blocks all Chinese communication with the outside world. And it's very tightly controlled. Or even open public spaces where crowds can gather and listen to fiery spaces. So either you tightly control it or you eliminate it or you put massive military. So Tiananmen Square in China is heavily militarized. Tahrir Square, which was the seat of the Arab Revolution in 2011, heavily militarized. Or you put all kinds of obstacles to make it inconvenient for people. So after the Arab Revolution happened in Tahrir Square, this was the, there was a very beloved architect, uh, this uh, icon in, uh, in Bahrain, in the city of Manama, which is the capital. It's called a pearl roundabout. So it's actually a busy roundabout, but this was a, it's a beautiful sculpture and it was a pride of uh, Bahrain. And so that becomes like a symbol, right? So people, if you have fiery thoughts, you, you say, let's see, just see what is happening to our Arab brothers in, in Egypt. We also want freedom from our nasty rulers. So people start coming. To prevent that, the rulers basically broke down that sculpture, dug all this up. So you can't, you cannot congregate and listen to people who are making fairy speeches. There is no space because they have, they have control of the TV. The people who are the fairy revolutionaries, where are, how are they going to reach to the other people? You prevent common knowledge by breaking down open spaces. And as another example, this is London's Trafalgar Square. It's a very highly touristed spot. Nelson's column here. These massive fountains were installed not just for beauty, but for riot, for crowd control. It was explicitly designed for crowd control to basically break up the people into different regions so that they are not like one big army. And this was done in the late 1800s. So, so there are all these examples. Once you see what happens, like how broadcasting mechanisms are either 
used by by uh, by powerful people or suppressed by powerful people you see that it has the same threads underneath we've been talking about synchronous systems where there is a things like a shared clock or there's a broadcast there's a shared medium in which everybody can be on the same page at the same time right but most of the world is not synchronous so if you send a message out on the internet that is asynchronous you don't know whether it's going to reach at all right you can have tcp ip you can basically keep uh, resending the probability may be high that you know you can eventually get there but you have no idea if the other other component is still alive so it's exactly like you know if you're on a on a phone and you're saying hello are you there hello are you there and then somebody says yeah i'm here until then you are uncertain but at no point are you certain suppose you are talking to a really really aged relative you are uncertain whether they have just copped it or are they still around what's going on right like constant is constant uncertainty and in this asynchronous systems it's a theorem in uh, in common in in uh, in logic where if you it's a truly asynchronous system where there is no upper bound on the amount of time it can take it can take arbitrarily long for a message to happen and if it takes infinitely long, that means the message is dropped. Right? You don't know which way, which it is. If there's no guarantee of an upper bound, then you are forever guessing, then you can never achieve common knowledge. You can be good enough based on probabilities, that's how it happens in real life. That things are sufficiently up most of the time, you can get your word through. In those periods of good functioning, you're fine, but you can never guarantee it. So if you are if you are making a statement that's I mean if you are doing something that is truly 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 critical, then you cannot rely on informal asynchronous systems, right? You need lot more guarantees. So here is something called a two generals problem. You have these two generals who are in this who are in this valley and they are going to go up, and one of them says gives a message saying we are going to attack at dawn. So he sends a message through a runner who's going to go through this and the protocol in the old period was that if you are a mess messenger then you are left alone messengers are represented that's like the geneva convention of the day where you are not going to be murdered if you are a, if you are not an active soldier right let's say that's the, they are play by certain honorable rules even though they are like all thugs so a1 sent a message to a2 saying we are going to attack at dawn and sent a messenger message messenger over there but a1 is in a period of uncertainty because he has no idea whether the messenger made it through or not. Maybe never. So he knows that if he attacks by himself, he's going to get massacred. He, he needs simultaneous coordination. He needs both of them to attack at the same time, at dawn or whenever, at the same time, in order to defeat B. Right? That is one of them can't take B on by the on their own. But unfortunately, they have a lossy network in the form of a messenger who could be attacked, who could die of exhaustion. Who may never reach, he may lose his way, whatever. So let's say he reaches there and this guy says, okay, we attack at dawn. Now the ACK has the same problem, right? The, the return message has the same option. This guy doesn't know whether the ACK reached. So he says, after saying, okay, he cannot be prepared and go there because he'll get massacred in case that guy did not get the, the, the ACK. So this guy sends a message again saying, um, okay, got it. So definitely we are on. Just because this guy doesn't know. So in order to let him know that he got the act, he sends another message. So constantly there's this feeling of uncertainty and you can show that you will never attack because you are never 100% sure that the other guy got it. So in this asynchronous, uh, all of this, so you're paralyzed into inaction. And in asynchronous systems, there's no guarantee of time of delivery. There's no guarantee of time of delivery or speed of processing because there's no limit on the number of backs and forths. So simultaneous coordination is impossible, which is says, in other words, you say that it's an impossibility of consensus. You cannot have consensus in an asynchronous system. So this famous result has been proved through different mathematical means. Through logic also it's been proved to say that if you have an asynchronous system where there is no upper bound on the on our reliability of a message uh, being transferred, then there cannot be a simultaneous coordination. But eventual coordination is possible in a period of stability. Uh, and eventually near simultaneous coordination. So near simultaneous could be the use of atomic clocks. So one of the things that Google does, for example, is they have a uh, all their data centers run using atomic clocks. 
so they have a global sense of the same time so because they can now rely on the same time so typically in computer networks if you look at typical clocks used in computing systems or in computers they drift a lot so there can be a quite a lot of difference between what one computer thinks the time is and what another computer thinks the time is sometimes up to like seconds in a day you can drift, drift apart if there's a really bad clock if the if the crystal heats up it's going to beat faster and the time is completely different right so and in order to mitigate that you have various protocols which sort of they keep gossiping with each other saying what's the time what's the time what's the time and they take an average of it and which is called a network time protocol ntp all computers run ntp and uh, you know so they they are sort of keeping track of each other's time and they are averaging it and say so, so roughly within a few milliseconds of each other they're just hanging out there but often that is not enough so if i want to say that so what google did was they created a entire framework which is based on atomic clocks which goes down to sub millisecond or in a microsecond accuracy it's not nanosecond because overall it takes some time to for the uh, for various internal systems to to stabilize and there they say that they can make a statement saying at this time we will we will uh, uh, commit the transaction so there is a there are two nodes there one here one there and the message that takes time will say we i'm going to uh, commit it at this time when the, when the message will be eventually retried and retried and retried and at that time it's considered committed there is instantly by the fact that there is a shared clock everywhere because of the use of atomic uh, clocks in every data center because of that substrate other services can rely on making definitive statements so they are trying to get out of the asynchronous uh, mode by using a shared synchronous medium uh, using satellites and uh, and uh, atomic clocks so that's all i have uh, so now we have i know that you have common knowledge about common knowledge so that's all we have for today so can you give an example where someone should not know something because you are trying to make sure here that someone knows something classic uh, cases are uh, information secrecy right so in, so this happens in a lot in in programming languages uh, there is a uh, there is a very nice field of study called uh, information analysis so if you look at look at some code and you say here is some bit of code that has that is privy to some secret information here is this bit of code that ought not to be privy to the information is there any way in which this bit of code can learn some information can leak from there to here right are there any channels by which something can um, uh, some other piece of code can can be learned now there are if you look at uh, uh, the traditional cryptography uh, the way people break various uh, codes you will be stunned by the number of channels that are available for what you th for what are communications so for example uh, people use heat so if a chip is much hotter then it's doing more computation and that is a signal for you to to infer something and people have broken rsa codes based on how hot something is happening right i one of the people i used to work with in cambridge he was a security researcher he still is ross anderson uh they did this thing where they know that you know this old crts um, you know cathode ray tubes because it has a fair amount of rf uh noise right because it's it's an electron gun that spraying electrons on a phosphor so it's producing a whole lot of electronic noise right that noise has some meaning so you sitting in some other room you are monitoring the noise emitted by this it's rf noise but they figured out that this actually carries some information and they could actually uh Uh, decode what was being shown on the screen based purely on the noise rf noise from the signal so it doesn't have to be an explicit communication the fact that something is leaking i mean, recently i heard this uh, other uh, um, cool way where from a distance looking at the way the leds are going 
they were able to de de decrypt a, a particular package because you are sending a packet and you see the way the LEDs are blinking and you infer something. There's a, any number of covert channels that are there. So the traditional means of communication that you think of like actually sending a message or being silent, there are way many more ways of communicating information. If you look up Ross Anderson's page on uh, uh, and their associates page, the security group at the University of Cambridge, you'll see a lot of examples like this. It's quite fascinating. So I have a question regarding asynchronous systems. So as you said that uh, simultaneous coordination is not possible in asynchronous systems. Then how do we decide while uh, for a particular project or a, for a particular problem, uh, we need an asynchronous system or a synchronous. For an example, you know, when we are automating a drone. So for that, we need some systems like some services which should be asynchronous. For example, uh, the drone is flying and we want it uh, to perform some command, for example, give a pitch. But we also need some other telemetry data to be communicating with it. So that can be asynchronous, but we are lacking with the common knowledge here. You need certainty in places where it really matters. Now, if it's merely telemetry data, it's merely monitoring. And you, you so one access of one access could be to say, if the data is lost, big deal. There's more coming because anyway, the data has a very limited lifespan. It was meant for that time, new data is coming. So in the case of logging or telemetry data. It's a no. It's it's not. Uh, uh, it's not crucial. But in cases of say a database transaction where something has to go through and you cannot rely on the network, then you only all you can do is basically keep retrying, right? So for example, suppose there are three of them, three computers, right? And they are they are uh, communicating with each other. So you update the state of let's say you are, you have gmail right you update the state of that uh, of your mail account on one and it gets replicated to two others right so it's uh, there are three now let's say there is a partition that happens between the computers so there's one computer is on one side of the partition and two computers on the other side of the partition right so the one on the one side of the partition has no clue it's down because it's on the network so the network is down it has no idea until it discovers that it's not able to talk so one of the decisions that you will take because you know that such a thing can happen is that if any command comes to it it will immediately reject it because it cannot take an action by itself the other two will communicate and say okay we are on the majority side of the partition so yes we can still go ahead right so for every update that you make as long as you have a majority quorum, majority is saying, yes, we got it, then it's considered committed. So you need, everybody needs two stages where you say, oh no, I'm going to send it, but don't update it yet. I need to see that a majority got it. And as soon as the majority gets it, you'll say, okay, all of us in this next round, I'll, we, we can agree to be committed. So there are edge cases where you say in the second round, you could lose network. Yeah, sure. You're always in a period of uncertainty, but the probabilities in real life are such and uh, as systems get more and more robust, the probability that networks are down, systems are down becomes lower and lower. So it's vanishingly small. So at some point you say, this, we can live with this. So in the, there is a fundamental theorem in asynchronous system which says that all you can do is be safe, but you cannot ensure liveness. So you can be, you can ensure soundness, the fact that it is sound, it is correct. But you cannot ensure liveness, you cannot ensure that it will always be live. Because that is something that's imposed on the system. If it's a really flaky network, there's nothing you can do about it. Right? So, for example, if it is a traffic a light situation, the traffic, all the traffic lights have gone, the prudent thing to do would be to stop. Everybody to stop. And then in some places like the US, you have a formal protocol about who gets to go next. Right? Even in the absence of lights. But if you don't have that, then you have India, where even if you have lights, you just go shamelessly. <laughs> the same case, like can we handle it using some ensuring it in future? Like we are giving a pitch, we give a command for a pitch, but simultaneously we need the delimited data. We yeah. can give it as a ensure as a future call that it will, uh, the task, the command is sent, it will communicate its telemetry part and in future in another core or maybe another sub process it would run it. 
Yeah, so as long as your clocks agree, right? So, so you're basing it on a synchronous score somewhere, saying my clock and your clock are running roughly at the same speed. And so when I say plus X seconds, I know what you mean. And I can put an upper bound on how much time the signal will take. So you can say X minus that time and that's when it kicks in. So you have common knowledge because you've built it on a synchronous score. But if you don't have a common clock system, then what does seconds mean, right? I could be thinking it's 3 p.m., you think it's 4 a.m., then there's no common thing. So often in all these systems, getting the clocks right, getting the clocks to be synchronous is the biggest. <laughs>